Over those two and a half years, what has changed and what has remained the same? It's a big question. Uh, like, so much has changed. I think we've seen just such a normalization of, of hate. You know, really, it really, since I've been here, uh, we've, we've for sure seen a normalization of, of anti Semitic uh, graffiti hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to now see for sure a normalization of anti-Semitic assaults to the point of where we've had to put out, where there's so many happening now in the last couple of weeks where we've, we don't even know what to do anymore because we put out rewards and we can't keep putting out a reward release every single time something happens. So it's just been, it's been a, a sea change for us as an office because we have the largest amount of Jews you know, in the diaspora or in my region, in, in my in New York, New Jersey region. And I think that it's, the climate that we've seen, the ca you know, in my conversations with NYPD, like the coffee, cl you know, can lid has popped off, and I think that that lid is not going to be put back on anytime soon. So I think it's it's been a real challenge for us as a staff. I mean, just post post Pittsburgh, we've we've received hundreds, hundreds of calls of anti-Semitic uh, incidents that have taken place. Not all those are legitimate. Some are, you know, I my my cat, you know, said Heil Hitler, you know, so they're kind of, so there are some crazies, but just in my, in my uh, conversations with my staff to take these calls, you know, they think better than 60% of those calls are actually legitimate calls. And that's, that's just a sea change. It's just, it's, it, the right. volume, the climate and the volume, I think are the biggest changes since I've, since I've been here. So when you say an anti-Semitic incident, what is, what is that? What so do you, how, what do you categorize as, as that? So law enforcement categorizes when you see like NYPD or FBI putting out numbers, those are hate, those are crimes. Those are actual crimes. When, when you see our numbers from the EDL, sometimes they're different than what you see from law enforcement because our numbers include harassment and other things that are not necessarily going to rise to the level of being a, uh, a crime. So say, for example, in a school, you know, someone has uh, a swastika uh, put on their desk in pencil. Or actually in Arizona, my, my colleague in Arizona, some, somebody at Target today uh, put a, a paper made swastika near where the, the Hanukkiahs uh, and menorahs are when they're being sold. That's not a crime, that, that's, that would be in our audit as an incident. And those incidents are going up and happening more and more and more frequently where people are being harassed and we're seeing it more in schools than we've ever before. Schools are really the area where we're seeing, last year we saw a 100% increase in, in, in K through 12 uh, of anti-Semitic harassment uh, and incidents in New York State. 100% increase. 100% increase. So 100% from what? From previous year. No, but I understand. But in other words, if you had to be in, in, in real numbers, you know, it's doubling from... I think, uh, don't quote me on this. I think, like, I think it's like 30 to 60, something in that vicinity. Okay, okay. but it's still... It, it's significant. It's, it's still it's way more it's than we should have. And I think the, the, not everyone's reported. I think that's the biggest thing. One of the biggest things I've seen with parents you know, we've, we've had the unfortunate deal with a lot of private schools across the state and the children are so laser focused into wanting to go to the Ivy League school or that track, that particular track they're on. And they're so terrified that if they really do report it openly, mm -hmm. that in some way their name's going to get out there. If their name gets out there, then all of a sudden their, their son or daughter is not going to have that, that track that they, that they so desperately want. And so I think that's some of the conversations we're also having. So even though there's this, there, I think there's a significant underreporting of, of what's going on. So I, when I look at our numbers, I think they're, it's a, you can't look at them as just the, the actual number. It's the actual number that's being reported and that people have had the courage uh, to report. So what do, you think, what do you think the number really is? I, mean, I, I don't want to speculate, but I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's way more than what it is. I think people okay. just you know, are, 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 don't want to a lot of times get engaged in that, especially at the school age. Even, even in not in school age, we, we have people that sometimes have struggled to, to, you know, to report swastikas uh, painted on their homes because they don't, they don't know who did it. Is it a white supremacist who did it? It may be some random kids, it may not, right? So they don't want to report it necessarily because they're afraid of what the, you know, the reaction is mm -hmm. going to be to that person, maybe retribution at some point, someone that comes back to their house, someone attacks them coming out of their car. So there's, there's, there's legitimate you know, fear of, of reporting for sure. So we've seen certainly just in the last couple of weeks, you know, alone, 
a lot of number of incidents. Mm-hmm. There was uh, swastikas pinned on the walls at Columbia University. I was at a professor's office. Uh, at uh, Penn State, outside of Zeta Beta Tau fraternity, there's a Hanukkah, yep. right? That was knocked a large one that was knocked over, and it was put back up, and it was knocked over again. Uh, even some incidents here in Rye. Yep. And so, what do you what do you think's going on? Like, where? What's going on that's causing all this, or allowing it to bubble to the surface? I think we've had. I think the ad, there's a lot of things. I think for the political climate, and I'm not going to blame this on the president, but I think that the, 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 the overall climate that we've seen since the election season, and it was a real bruiser of a campaign, and it's, and it's and trickled down even to city politics. We've seen it. Mm-hmm. It's just really kind of dirty, tough campaigning, and, and the polarization of this country that, you know, people may have thought the country was polarized, I think, you know, five, six, seven years ago, but I think we've really gone to our corners. And I think people are far left, far right. The, the moderate, you know, precious moderate middle uh, is, is disappearing before our very eyes. And I think that when, when people get extreme on either side, uh, people get extreme in their behavior as well. And I think that we're seeing, you know, I think a reaction to that based off of, off of the campaign. And, you know, I think we saw that in the last midterm, this last previous election, mm-hmm. saw in the presidential election. I think there's, there's definitive lines that people are, are not willing to come out. And I think when you don't have those conversations with people, um, it's, it's a big problem. And I think since, since the election season, with the advent, especially the Internet, people are, you know, when you're on Facebook or you're on Twitter, you're only following the people or news sources that you want. You're only friending the people that you that are, have the like-minded thing, and I, I, I've seen this with my own, my, my own friends. I, my, some of my groom has been my wedding won't even speak to me anymore because of the work that I do at the ADL, and we were roommates, the closest friends. I mean, super close friends, but because of some of my stances on publicly on certain issues, yeah. that's eroded our friendship. And I think if that can happen, imagine what can happen, kind of in general. And I think when people are only only focus on the information and news that they wanted. You, you lose out on, on all this other information as well. And I think that, again, that polarization is, is I think, leading to a lot of this. And I think it's for sure trickling down uh, to young people. I think that people are getting this at the dinner table. Uh, they're getting this from, uh, uh, from, from so- these sources. There's no way we can filter what our kids are getting uh, on the internet. When you have a 15, 16 year old, there's no way you can totally monitor what they're getting. And, and white supremacists and other groups understand that and that's where they're, they're going. And it's, it's, it's a huge problem for us. Say more about that, because you and I spoke a little bit about this yeah. on the phone, and you talked to me about, you know, when, when our, some of our kids are playing video games, and they have headphones on, and what they're hearing out there, they're not just playing with their friends down the street. No, I they're mean, I think there's, on, or on chat rooms, you know, um, you know, kids right now have access to the entire world, and they're hidden. You know, the example I always like to use is when, when the ADL was very involved in the demasking of the Ku Klux Klan in the 60s. And when the Klan could no longer meet with its masks on, it was a very difficult thing for the Klan. They, they, they meet, they could, where could they really meet, you know? And, that, all the, and back then, long distance phone calls cost, you know, like $20 a minute, right? And I remember trying to make a call on my grandmother's phone in Brooklyn. I was getting, you know, I'd get shot. And uh, so I think, so that really hurt them. And w- what's happened was in the 60s, we had about 20, we, our polling on anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States started in the mid 60s. And right around the time the Klan was starting to, to fall apart, relative to, you know, there's still a Klan, but it wasn't, the strength is not the same. But 25% of the American population was anti Semitic. Now the population we feel is but 12 to 14% of the American population is anti Semitic. But until about, even when I graduated college in 1998, we barely had email and we barely had like Netscape and AOL was just starting to get. Was, you know, so that's 98. So from like the mid 60s until really the late, into the late 90s, it was really hard for any of these groups to really, there was no chat rooms. It was, much, it was very hard for them to interact. And then it was like the atom bomb went off it, with the internet, the advent of all this stuff. And look now, Facebook, Instagram, podcasts, uh, Twitter, there's so many ways for them to be able to communicate. We saw that with Robert Bowers in, in Pittsburgh, was, able on, was on the site Gab. And I think so that is, Getting to your video game thing, video games are another thing. They're, you know, when you see flyering of white supremacists, we're not worried about Identity Europa as a group. We're worried about what the activity is. I, I had a death threat uh, recently, and, and the death threat was from a person who was uh, an, an outlier, who was not part of a group, but fe- FBI felt that that person was activated because of another cell 
believe it or not, of all places, Pittsburgh, and was, was, was activated and acted as, was acting as a lone wolf. We're worried about how these groups are out there interacting. One of the areas they are is actually on like PlayStation and on, on Xbox. There's a lot of ways now kids can play through the internet and they're playing with other people. White supremacists are actually using this as a platform to recruit and whispering to your kids' ears and saying things to your kids while they're playing you know, Madden 2018 or while they're playing NHL 2018 or when they're playing whatever you know, shooting game, whatever it is, that's where a lot of this is going. And that's a really scary thing because as parents, how can you, you know, we worry about our kids, but you can't monitor it all. But that's the things you have to start really taking seriously. Right, wow. So how bad is it really right now, let's say, for Jews in America? This is not state-sponsored anti-Semitism no, like it was not in the Germany Holocaust. in the 1930s, right? No. So how bad is it? And also about other minority groups in America. So I think my line has been even, you know, when I, I think when I was here, I said this line, and it's changed a little bit, but I said, this is still the best time to be a Jew maybe ever in history, you know, in any one, in any one country, uh, except maybe for Israel right now, because Israel's thriving so, so beautifully. But I think in the diaspora, this is the best time it's ever been. I think the, the amount of success we've had educationally, the success that we have to be able to meet tonight and have inner, inner group leaders here and, and have a diverse audience and and have just a single security guard and not have, have a major police presence and be able to do this openly and put ads out on patch.com and put it all over and not really feel, you know, thank God that we really, really have to worry about our inherent safety. I think it shows how uh, amazing we have it. We have access to, uh, to elected officials that we wish we had when the St. Louis happened. We have access to universities that my grandparents only dreamed. We have access, you know, I, when I sat next to Governor Cuomo, uh, around the time of the bomb threats and announced $25 million uh, monies towards help protecting institutions uh, in the state of New York. If my grandmother was alive, a blessed memory, we could have seen her grandson sitting next to her, an Italian you know, Catholic governor announcing protection for the Jews. She would have, she would have, <laughs> she would have fell she would have off her chair. Right. Yeah, you know? So I think that we have to be very aware of, of how good we have it. But the big change since the speech two and a half years ago is my yeah, but now is... We've had it really good in other societies as well. Mm -hmm. We had it really good in Germany uh, for, for, for a period. We've had it really, we had it really good in Spain. We had it really good in Italy. We had it really good in other, other locations. And I think, you know, if you talk, I spoke in France uh, about a year ago to Jewish leadership. And if you speak to leadership in France about what's going on in the Jewish community there, it's been a very, very difficult time for the Jewish community. And I think that they were also doing very, very well for a very long time, post, uh, even post-Holocaust. I think we have to be keenly aware of what we have and not take it for granted. And I think hopefully this moment of, of Pittsburgh and of this immense rise of anti-Semitic incidents and, you know, just almost in a daily basis, there has been something in mainstream news media about an anti-Semitic incident taking place in this country. Uh, we have to be very, very aware uh, of what we have and it can, ha it can happen like that. That we, that we lose what we have. Now, we're very unique. We have an amazing government, governmental structure. We have a constitution. Uh, you know, we have, there's a lot, we have amazing relationships with Jews with the police. Police have always been one of the biggest reasons that Jews have been excommunicated. The police have always been that first group that's, that's tried to push right. us out. We, we have a tremendous relationship with FBI and, and local law enforcement. Uh, but if we, don't ha we, if we don't keep our ha head on a swivel, I think things can happen really rapidly and you just have to look at history. I think other minority groups are are feeling this as well. Um, you know, yesterday I was at a press conference with Borough President uh, Eric Adams. I had an interesting day. I was in Brooklyn for two events. One was uh, an 1130 press conference because of desecration of a Catholic church. And then I had to go meet at the 71st precinct with leadership because of the amount of anti-Semitic hate crimes that have taken place in the last three weeks in Brooklyn. And getting a briefing from the uh, uh, Assistant Chief of Police and other, other law enforcement hate crimes task force. So, you know, it was a moment of, of hate. And, and my day yesterday was hate towards, towards Christians and hates towards Jews on the same day in the same borough. And I think, so, you know, we do a lot of work. I do a lot of work with, with, the, with the other. Um, and we I, I've been, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico. We sent an MOU with, with Mexico, Mexican government. Um, we do a lot of work with, with immigrants and Latin American community, the Haitian community, the African American community. And in my conversations with those leaders, I know that those minority groups are 
feeling the same kind of pressures that the Jews are. The ADL has been around for over 100 years. We are the 911. We have you know, beautiful booklets and audits, and we, we are really a machine when it comes to getting these numbers and take, having intake. Other minority groups, like the Sikh community, the, the Hispanic community, they don't have the same infrastructure we do. They don't have, when there's a hate crime towards their people, there's not 25 rabbis that are going to jump down with the JCRC, ADL, Federation, boom. We have, a, we have a protocol. They just don't have that. To say it's not happening to them is, I think, it's it really, again, it's a, it's a lack of procedure. It's a lack of infrastructure and architecture in the, within their space. But, but certainly when I speak to leaders, we know that it's happening, especially to immigrants. The immigrant minority populations, whether the Hispanic, Hispanic population is getting, is getting it, the Haitian community is getting it. And I think that it's, you know, these are things we as Jews, again, it can't just look at ourselves that we're experiencing anti-Semitism. We have to be keenly aware that this, this, this environment and climate is affecting the other as well. And it's our time to stand together. And even though we haven't maybe done that in a very long time, the way we did in the 60s, it, it's a time for us to start really looking to that again, because we're all in this together. We really, we really are. So this is an interfaith gathering, right? It was co-sponsored by, as I said, a number of houses of worship, Amazing. both Jewish and Gentile, and also Wainwright House here in Rye. And the Wainwright House is a unique institution that deals with sort of spirituality and mindfulness and really about creating peace. It was developed in the interwar period between the two world wars. Um, what do you think the response of the Gentile community needs to be right now, needs to be to sort of what we are seeing right now? And what can all of us do to affect some change? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I think it's the Gentile community and it's the, it's the non-Gentile community. I think it's the Muslim community, the Sikh community. It's, 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 it's every community needs to respond, I think, in the same way, which is, is, is to be an upstander mm -hmm. right now when something happens. And I think in, in any circle where if we're in a, you know, at a Jewish Shabbat table and someone is speaking, you know, negatively about another minority group, I think yeah. it's our job to stand up and, and, and to say something. I think if we're in a Gentile, you know, uh, uh, Sunday, you know, afternoon uh, dinner after church, then then it's it's having that same kind of conversation if someone's talking about a Jew or another minority group. I think it's all of our jobs to stand up, you know, equally for each other. And I think it's 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 the same theory, same action. And it just the the, you know, the the table may have we may have a different book right. or a different scripture or you know a different uh, you know you know sociological kind of norm or religious norm, but it doesn't take away from what the action should be. And I think that's a human action that we should be doing right now. And this is a human problem. And um, I hope that all groups can kind of realize that and, and not necessarily silo each other off. I think we've done a great job of, of doing that politically. And, I, and it can't, I hope we really can start coming together more. The biggest part of this is, I think, is while you may disagree, all these groups may have certain disagreements on certain key issues. My, my, in my time now of doing a lot of interfaith and intergroup work, that you can find the majority of the other has the majority values of you. You may, you may be, instead of harping on that one or two things that you don't have in common, focus on the 98% that you do have in common. And I think, you know, look at it half full, not half empty. When you're in any, any inter interactions with your friends, other groups, I think it's really easy to go the negative route. This has become such a negative space. Press is so negative. Our world is becoming negative. You know, the way you can make your world more positive is by looking at every interaction, I think, with a half full. Right. mentality focus on the common humanity that we have focus on the common humanity exactly yeah. exactly um it's the last question before we open it up to yeah. questions and we hope hopefully you you have more questions that, that you want to ask and that's why we have the the two microphones that are here um a mother who lives in summit new jersey mm -hmm. told me on sunday about swastikas that were found in the bathroom of the middle school and on the outside of the wall of the scotch plains high school yeah. in that neighborhood yeah. and she said to me she said so what do I say to my kids? Um, her kids are in elementary school, but she's really struggling with this. And so what do we say to our children or our grandchildren who might be seeing this or experiencing this for the first time? The truth is I think many of us who are, are many of us sort of adults of my generation uh, are experiencing some of this also for the first time yep. ever. Um, but what do we say to our kids? I think you gotta be honest with them. I think you gotta have the, you gotta have the conversation with them. I have you know, an 11 year old and an eight year old. And uh, when Pittsburgh happened and daddy had to leave uh, after Shabbos on you know, Saturday night and go into the city and, and then was gone all day Sunday. And, you know, they, they understand what I do. And uh, even though they go to a you know, Jewish day school and they live in a very homo homogeneous environment and they, they're, they're probably, they may not experience, 
some of that. So my job, I think, to take them out of their comfort zone a little bit and, and show them. I think all of us need to make sure we're exposing our children to the other. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's starting to have those conversations. And, and, and as difficult as they may be, is, is the, you know, we have curricula at the EDL. If you go to our website, we have amazing table talk discussions that you can have with your kids on every one of these and every one of these issues. But I think it all starts from a place of, of you know, coming in with appropriate language mm -hmm. based on the age of the child. But, but for sure, you know, be willing to have that conversation. You, if a child is experiencing it, then you have to be able to talk to them about it. Otherwise, they're gonna find information elsewhere, they're gonna get their information from someone else, and you need to control that narrative as a parent. And yeah, I think it's the first time for a lot of families, and we've seen now four different uh, school uh, systems in, in New Jersey that are experiencing this. We've, we're seeing, again, more and more of this uh, across New York and New Jersey. And uh, I think, again, when, when things are happening with young people, I mean, the, the, some of the assaults on, on the Orthodox population in Brooklyn, these are start, you know, uh, a week and a half ago, it was a 12 year old boy and a nine year old boy, and the perpetrators are like 14 to 15 year olds. You know, so that's, you know, seriously violent, you know, attacks. So I think it's, you know, th this, is, this is concerning because if we don't get in front of it, then, mm -hmm. then, then it, it will metastasize. And I think, uh, the biggest job, too, is also for the parents to, 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 to show outrage to the, to the school and to make sure that the, the principals and the superintendents are, are holding their school at the highest level and ensuring that th this kind of hate, you know, in the same way if someone uh, called someone another racial, uh, you, know, you know, word or anything, that there should be equal amount of, you know, infuriation. Because that's the biggest problem is one of the, one of the people, like, if you talk to other minorities in, in these, like, you know, it's like a perfect example, we have a lot of anti-Semitism on college campuses. And so we, like Rutgers has had some issues in, and so we, we go in there and we've, we've, you know, we've had conversations. And one of the biggest things that we get is this can't just be about anti-Semitism. It's very easy for Jews to kind of put our lenses on and say, this has to be about the incident and the anti-Semitism. We need to bring anti-Semitism education in. That's the wrong answer. There are other minorities in those schools that, as I said, are experiencing it for sure as well. So it has to be about overall anti-bias education. I think it has to be about the other and exposing you know, everyone to those differences and making it a positive experience. And it can't just be about the one area. Now, I think part of that needs to be when there's an overt anti-Semitic incident, there needs to be an understanding of what anti-Semitism is, what the swastika means, what, what the, you know, that kind of stuff. They can be part of it, but it needs to be a broader, a broader narrative as well. Mm -hmm. It's you critical. You've been doing this proactively? Oh, I think it's, it's a proactive. Like sitting your kids down, and we're going to have this conversation just like you would about, you know, other other important. Topics oh, I absolutely. I would. I, I think the. I mean, especially for teenagers, absolutely, hundred percent. I think teenagers need to understand what's going on. I think they need to be aware of, of the climate and having those real conversations and and what they may see, and also have the conversation for them to understand what is wrong. If they haven't experienced it before, they may not know what to do with it, and they may be afraid to bring it back to the mom and dad and have that conversation. So there needs to be. If you have that dialogue proactively. If God forbid something does happen, you've at least already started that conversation. So then you can start having that so that they'll be more ready to have that conversation with you if God forbid it happens. Thank you. Yeah. So we want to hear from you. This is a conversation, right? This is not just a presentation. Um, and we have two microphones. I'm Ron Cohn from Member Community Synagogue. Hi, Ron. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us and share your expertise. I just have a little technical naive question. You mentioned how they can get to teenagers who are playing video games, mm -hmm. Madden 2018 or NHL 2018. They can talk to them. How, how does this happen? So in the games, people have headphones and headsets. And you can find other players in user rooms because all, all these uh, games now are connected to Wi-Fi. And they have the ability, they're almost like mini computers. So you can, you can actually use them to play DVDs. You can use them to do other things. So they're not just a video game. Like when I was, you know, in the early 80s, you had Atari, put the cartridge in, there was nothing else. You had the little rabbit of your TV in the back. And now it's much more sophisticated and you can actually play real time with other people. Uh, and gaming is becoming huge. I mean, gaming is now actually, people are getting scholarships, believe it or not, to play division one gaming. There's gaming. I, I know it's, it's not, but no, watch, and, and MIT has a lab, has the gaming lab at, at MIT that you can go and and so the people want to compete against each other to be the very best. They compete with other people in other, in other divisions, other rooms, and they have those conversations. Thank you. Yeah. It's been my experience, and, and I want to know uh, what it is in your view, uh, that I sometimes experience uh, racism by Jews toward uh, African Americans sure. or, or other groups. You mentioned before you've got to say something, so give us some tools. What can we say when we hear that? And, and also, the first part of the question is, how common is that in your experience? 
Well, in my experience, um, I actually haven't had a lot of people in my space that have overtly crossed the line. Do I feel that they've crossed the line subtly? Yes. Well, it's always subtly. It's always subtly. I don't have anybody in my world that's like dropping, you know, the N-word, you know, and I think, but I do think that there are some kind of, you know, red flags that people give out. And, you know, I was just on, on, on PBS and um, the host, uh, uh, Jenna Flanagan, who's African-American, and I, we know each other really well. And she, and she, the last question she asked me in the interview was, you know, well, there seems to be a lot going on where I have, someone says, I have one black friend, but when then they talk about the overall, or I have one Hispanic friend, but then they talk about the overall. And my answer to her was, that I, I see that a lot, is that there's a lot of like, I have one, fr well, you know, Jim isn't like that at all. Jim is different. But when you talk about the, the collective, they're horrible. Like that to me is a, that's a red flag. Like that's something that, and I think when that happens, that's where our job is to say, you know what, whoa, what do you, what do you mean by that? What do you, what do you mean? Like what, when you make that kind of comment, what do you mean, what do you mean by that? That, that, I, that doesn't feel right. What, you, know, you know, and I think you have to stop somebody instead of just free flowing, you let it go. And I think the hardest thing is, is a lot of times there's a famous Seinfeld episode where George Costanza is like, oh, I wish I could go back and, you know, I had to dig. I, I want to just go back and say it. I think the key is, is trying to, is trying to when it, when it feel when you feel it, and I think all of us have a moral compass, and when that moral compass gets a little bit jostled, that's the moment where you feel like you got. It. That's the moment you can't let it go, and because it's very hard to come back to it later on. You can, but in that moment, as hard as it may be, unless it's like a real, you don't want to shame somebody publicly, unless it's really really bad. But I think you should try, especially if it's a one on one interaction, like stop the conversation and say, listen, I don't like what you just said. It made me feel really uncomfortable. And, and talk about why it made you feel uncomfortable. And ask that person really, what, why are they, are they feeling that way? What, 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 what is, what, who do you, like, I'm gonna give it an example, right? When I started at the ADL, I certainly, I think had, especially as a person that worked so much only in the Jewish community, I was really kind of sequestered off. And early in my career as the United Way, my dad was a civil rights leader in the 60s and 70s, but I was mostly exposed to the African-American population. My, I, that was really where I was, really more comfortable. That's where I, I, was, I grew, up in, grew up in it. Um, I never met a Muslim. Not really. Not, not, I knew, never real. I knew maybe through a handshake or whatever, I never really spent any time with a Muslim. For sure came in with, with some preconceived notions about, you know, thinking, God, every Muslim is Islamic extremist, da, 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 da. I start this job. I go to, to, to Harlem and I go to Breakfast Ramadan and a very small mosque, a mosque that actually housed a Chabad. The, the, they gave a part of the space so Chabad could have, could have, wow. have a minion every day. Okay, completely blew my mind. And from that moment on, I've actually, I've really started to try to have more and more of these kind of relationships with people that I really don't have relations with. And I realized I formulated my opinion through the media, through other people that really probably didn't have those relationships, never even had that experience. I think some of it is putting our, ourselves in our own uncomfortable situations. And if someone says something, do you even know somebody like that? What, what experience do you even have with somebody like that? And I think part of that is, 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 have, is starting to have that conversation. I, it's, it's not like a, a toolkit, like a hammer, but I think it's, hopefully it's, it's stopping it in the moment and, 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 and trying to then oh, maybe pivot that conversation to a place where you can start hashing through what made you feel uncomfortable, especially if you feel it, it went past that moral compass point. Is that, is that, is that helpful at all? But that's, I think, so you don't think, I think you say that statement bothered me. You're not calling them, you're not, you're not saying I'm a racist or you're a bigot. That statement bothered me. Explain what you mean by that statement. Put it back on the open-ended question. You know, what do you mean by that, what you just said? Let, let them answer it. Let them give them a shot of clarification. You know, but if they can't clarify, then, then you really have uh, more of a, uh, I, think, I, I think the challenge is in this political environment, so many people that are accepting certain kind of norms in language that, and, they, and they, they defend it. It becomes almost indefensible for us to be, to be you know, for, for certain people, as it's gone, it, the line is getting pushed and pushed and pushed now. It becomes harder and harder to say, God, I can't, I, I'm finding less and less common ground with this person. And people that you have sometimes 20, 30 year relationships with. It's very difficult. It's a tough time. Thank you. Kill. I wonder if you'd comment on this uh, the fact that uh, press reports at college, about college mm -hmm. harassment 
often ties in with Israel's policies, uh, right or wrong, but comment on that relationship and whether or not it's in fact a major cause of, uh, of this kind of harassment. Well, the, the challenge is right now a lot, of, a lot of Jewish students who are Zionist kids that you know, maybe have a belief in a two-state solution, um, they want to get involved. You know, this climate we're in right now socially, they want to get involved socially on campus. They want to be involved in happy, uh, helping other people of color. They want to help uh, with other social issues, women's rights, all these kind of things. And with the beginnings, it really, you know, we're knee-deep in uh, I think called intersectionality, where every, all these major issues, somehow Israel gets put into the mix. Um, and I think it's, it's become harder and harder. And from those, those difficult conversations, kids are then being, it goes from being anti-Israel rhetoric into unfortunate anti-Semitic rhetoric. And so that's the kind of harassment we're seeing. We're also seeing traditional basic anti-Semitism where the kids are being called a kike or they're, they're really being called out for just being Jewish. But a lot of it is stemming and starts from a place around Israel. And then it kind of, it, it kind of it, it trickles, in, it trickles into other things. Uh, we're seeing a lot of kids that are just not prepared for what they're going to experience on campus. And they're, they're not able to uh, defend themselves either from a you know, really on Jewish standpoint or for as, even as a Zionist. And whatever spectrum of Zionism that is, they're, they're having a hard time defending themselves. And I think that's a, it's a real challenge for young people. And, and, but, but there is anti-Semitism going on on campus right now where there's swastikas being you know, drawn there, you know, we had at NYU, we've had, you know, some really tough stuff happening at Vassar. We've had really tough stuff happening in the CUNY system um, that are more traditional, tr traditional anti-Semitism. How does ADL respond on various campuses then? We, we, go, we talk to the presidents. And, you know, so I, you know, I, before Chancellor Milliken left for, for uh, UT, the University of Texas system, he and I were working closely to try to help the CUNY system implement. And we, we've started implementing uh, anti-bias initiatives within these schools. It's called the Campus of Difference. Um, the Vassar president, uh, who's no longer there, uh, there's a new president now who's actually been very, very engaged with us. So Vassar had, had a lot of issues uh, within the Jewish Studies Department, believe it or not. A lot of this, there, it was it become very difficult. Um, you know, we go to the, we, we talk to the president, we talk to the trustees, uh, we're, we, talk, we use Hillel. Uh, every campus is different. In, in Vassar, Chabad is actually the leading uh, voice on campus, even for secular mm -hmm. students, by the way. Uh, when you go to Hillel, it's Rabbi Sarna in NYU. That, that, that's like the, right. the big, so every campus is different. And sometimes it's the it depends on the size of the school. That may be the, the, the dean of that school you're going to go to. Like we had issues with Barnard. Um, you know, so it, it varies, but we always are on it. Columbia University, I'm speaking at Teachers College next week. I'm on a panel with, uh, with David Harris, who's the CEO of AJC. He and I are speaking on a panel with another person from uh, Facing History Ourselves, who's uh, an alumni of, of Teachers College at Columbia. So we're, you know, it's, it's, it's getting out there and, and trying to speak out against this and work with them and, and then also try to bring these kind of anti-bias initiatives and anti-training on anti-Semitism so these students know what, know what to deal with. They're just not educated. They're not prepared for these conversations. Right. Sir? I'm Ron Newman, uh, KPI. So, sure, sure. I think Thank I can figure it out. <laughs> so first, um, just a comment. If we wonder why these kids have a challenge explaining what's going on, I can tell you that happens to adults who have a tremendous knowledge of Israeli and mm -hmm. Jewish history. You know, personally as a liberal, supporting a lot of the you know women rights and the Me Too movement and, and, and all that, I have a challenge explaining Israel. So I, I think that that's a challenge to your question, sir, that, the, that Israel has yep. to do and yep. explain more in order to give these young people the tools. So that's just a comment on that. Um, a question. It, you mentioned that the uh, number of incidents is actually, compared to the 30s, it's really not that high. Um, and there's less... No, no, and we've had, we've had, it's actually gone down. Our num the number of anti-Semites in America are down from the 60s. Right. But the number of incidents that we're experiencing, like from la la we've been we were tracking anti-Semitic incidents since 1979. Last year was the highest we've ever had on record. Right. So my, my question is, and it reminds me a little bit about the whole issue with BDS, where, you know, went wild on social media, 
and it's the worst thing that can happen to us and all that. And I remember a conversation with my son mm -hmm. at UCLA who said, Dad, you know what? You guys got to take it down. All these postings and all that stuff and all the stand with us, you give them a platform. So, and, and in that retrospect, it may have been right because we can see that those incidents have been, you know, and the effect of BDS has been shrinking. My question is, do we give too much platform to the anti-Semites? by actually posting every single incident, um, by spreading it all over, um, by making it like such a huge deal. I mean, is that possible? It's a social media works to our business. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's possible, but I think if you're, if you're the individual or the community that experienced it, I think you want to know that people are standing with you. And I think as a, as a community that did not have a voice 60 or 70 years ago when something like that happened, uh, there was no voice. There was no media coverage. There was nothing to, to protect us or allow for others to know about it. When, we, when I put out something, it's not for the Jewish community. It's for the secular community. It's for, for people that are not Jews to understand that this is happening. Um, and I think it's our job to kind of be that voice uh, you know, for them. Can there be someone that's going to take that as, uh, you know, a green light to, to maybe copycat or, or, or to, you know, give them uh, more fuel? Maybe. Maybe, but I, I think that these things, these things were happening uh, anyway. And I think we have, when you have 14% of the American population, over 40 million people that are, we consider anti-Semites, that is, you know, I think it's our job to keep, keep it on, in the radar screen for elected officials, for uh, law enforcement, for all these people. Because again, like 30 years ago, we didn't have that access. 40 years ago, we didn't have that access that we have now. And it, those numbers help us in, in, in calling it out helps us because when it gets called out, it puts pressure on the police to make sure that they a, try to find the victim, they try to find the, the perpetrator. It puts, it puts, uh, it puts uh, pressure on the elected officials to make sure that there's gonna be more funding to, to do anti-bias work in the schools or to more policing in that, in that community. Um, the, normal, the only backlash is that there's normalization, which is becoming a challenge. So the more and more of these things happen is an example. When it was a swastika incident you know, five years ago, it was a press release, press conference, Big issue. Now it goes in our audit. Maybe it's a tweet. Maybe it's a tweet. Unless it's like in the office of a, of a Columbia professor. Um, but I, I still believe it's our job. When I, when, I, when I go to communities like Rochester and one of their cemeteries is desecrated, they want to make sure that the world knows that their cemetery was desecrated and, they, and that they had uh, serious issues. I, I do think there's a lot of ones we do not call out. There are many, many incidents I don't call out because I'm trying to fix things. There's a lot of schools, you know, within the Westchester community that have had issues that I could easily drop a press release and blow the whole thing up. But I want to, I play a long game where I want to be able to get as much education to that school or that school system. And if you call it out and you, and you, and you make a big deal out of it, it's, it's something that is, uh, is actually more detrimental long term. So there, there's a lot more that could be even put out that we don't put out. Um, and I think that's the big, the, the BDS component, my biggest fear, BDS has not been successful. Just, just explain a little bit for people. So boycott divestment sanctions of Israel, which is basically, you know, basically saying Israel, you're, you're, you're boycotting divesting from Israel because of a lot of their, their, their policies. A lot of people within the boycott divestment movement believe that Israel uh, should not even exist necessarily as, as a country. And the, not all, but, but some. And I think the, the challenge with BDS is that, yes, no BDS uh, on college campus, right, really has taken hold. Um, you know, you've seen votes at Michigan, you've seen votes at Columbia, Barnard. These are student votes. These have not gone up to the trustee level. Boycott divestment sanctions may not be successful at the at financial level, but our concern is that it's going to be uh, it, that it is going to affect the hearts and minds of a whole generation right. that will become the next trustees. Right now, trustees say 55 to 65 are the ones that are in control of these universities that when the next generation comes in who have been impacted by BDS, even though maybe it hasn't trickled up to the, to the trustees, in 20 years that could happen. Or, or the, the student leaders who are there on campus today who are involved in student government today. If will they, go into if government. They run, they, they'll go into government and all of a sudden they'll be the ones running for, for, office. for office at all sorts of levels and you're worrying about their hearts and minds. Yeah, exactly. Right, and that, that's, that's our fear. Not sure. what's happening now, what's happening, what, what the after effect is in, in 15 years. Right. Scott? So I just, I just talk a little bit about, in Charlottesville, there were the chants about Jews will not replace us. And the thing that, and maybe this is naive on my part, the thing that sort of I didn't get um, was 
it's got to be such a small Jewish population down south, like like a minority of a minority. Like it's the smallest. But like, who's really repl- like what Jew? What Jew is taking their jobs or like what? Why is that resonating with that set of people? And why does it make sense to them? If it's if it's because it seems so small to me. I mean, if you were in New York and they were chanting it, I could see maybe, but it's still a small minority sure. here. So, if you saw the reason why why uh, Robert Bowers attacked Pittsburgh, it was a Jewish institution because the Jewish institution was supporting Hayas, it was supporting immigration and immigration policy. And if you look in Europe, and you're seeing the similarities now here in the United States, is that there's a fierce. Uh, you know, within, the, within those, those far-right movements, hugely anti-immigrant. And a lot of these white supremacist uh, groups see Jews as the proponent of pro-immigration in America. The ones that are standing up for the other, they're the ones that are, um, you know, ADL is a perfect example. I signed an MOU with the Mexican government to protect, uh, you know, immigrants, in, in, you know, and we became, it became a national MOU. I was in Mexico City, I was on Bloomberg, talking as a Jewish leader talking about protecting immigrants, Mexican immigrants in America. And so we are out there. Thank God we're out there. It's the right place to be. But we're very much out there as, a, as, as an overall Jewish community that's, that's pro-immigration. Pro, uh, and these people, meaning Jews will not replace us, is that Jews will not repl- are not going to, they're not going to allow Jews in. We're, we're the ones bringing, that are saying it's okay for immigrants to come in that are going to replace those jobs. And Robert Bowers, that was what was on Gab. I mean, he was, he was fiercely against Hayes, and his, his rants on Gab were anti-immigration. Anti-immigration. And, it, and, and he used the Jewish church that was hosting Hayes, I believe that Shabbos, mm-hmm. and what, it was very heavily engaged in Hayes. And Hayes was meeting in Pittsburgh just a, a, a week earlier. There was Hayes meetings, I think, even here in, 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 uh, in, in New York. So it could have happened just as easily, you know, that kind of shooting could have happened in New York. And I think, so... That's a part of it. There's another component where there are just people that hate Jews. And we are, we are, and Mike Signer, who is the mayor of Charlottesville, he and I became close. I actually had him speak at my annual event last year after Charlottesville in New York. And we've stayed in contact with one another. He's no longer the mayor. He's a very smart guy and he's writing books and he's, you know, he's a Princeton graduate. He's a brilliant guy. And he, we, we talked about that. There, there is still a component of, of people still feeling that Jews can control the media. Jews control industry, Jews control uh, higher education, Jews control everything. And then if Jews control everything, then, then, then they have the ability to replace us as well. So our center on extremism, which is you know, very prominent and very prevalent on these issues, Orrin Siegel, who's our director, these are the two areas that he talks to me about when we talk about where white supremacy is. There's still that good old, you know, we hate Jews, they're kikes, we've hated them, it's the oldest form of hatred known to man is anti-Semitism. And there's the other component of this that we saw, especially around Robert Bowers, where white supremacist groups are talking about immigration and the link between Jews and immigration policy in, in, in the United States. And how fearful people of that area are that their jobs are gonna re- get replaced in the same way you're seeing it in Europe, in the nationalistic fervor that you're seeing in Europe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's staggering to me because maybe three years ago or four years ago when I was part of the panel, it felt like it was very, very fringe. Um, and now I feel like it's, it seems to me that it's very, very mainstream and that that's the message we're all getting. And I'm not sure how we handle that. I, I, I wish I had a magic bullet for that, for that answer. I think the, ch- the challenge is a lot of American Jewish kids, and I've been, we just had a whole student session at our Never Is Now conference on, uh, on Monday, and I've spoken all over, the, all over the state of New York on college campuses. I think it's what, I, mean, I talked about how great we have it as Jews, right, in this moment in time. I think young people have had it so, so amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in Rye or Westchester, you've lived, just lived such an amazing life. And you've never had to experience, you know, anti-Semitism where you really have to get, get the heck out. 
And I think, you know, when I was or, in Paris- Or any kind of discrimination for that matter. Right, you know, you've had a great life. And when I was in Paris, and you're, and you're talking to the Jewish community, and secular Jews, not, not Orthodox, trimal wearing, you know, tzitzit wearing Jews, you know, secular Jews are leaving France to Israel to make Aliyah, not because they want to be near the Kotel. They're there because for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think Jewish kids really don't fully understand. You know, we we're now are one or two generations from a grandparent that experienced the Holocaust being in the house or in, those, in that kid's lives. And I think that's another component of this. It gives them the ability to have these, you know, there is definitely honest critique of Israel. You know, ADL, whether it's a nation state law, other things, we've been, we've been critical of Israel and Israel policy. We fiercely believe in a two-state solution. We believe in Jew, you know, the, the right for Israel to be a Jewish state and, and Jewish and self-determination. We also understand why there needs to be in Israel. We had Abe Foxman as our former CEO, as a survivor, understood that better than anybody. And I think the challenge is these young people really don't understand why Israel needs to exist for them because they've never had to be in that fearful way. You go to the UK, go to France, go, I mean, people, young people are having, they're having to leave their businesses. You know, they've had to make Aliyah, and Aliyah in France, 50% a year increase every year for five years until last year. I don't know what the numbers are yet for this year. I talked to Kreef. That's significant. And so it's funny, I actually had this conversation with the Israeli consulate, and I said, what you need to do is kind of flip it. You need, to, you need to start finding those secular families that are moving to Israel from a safety concern, and you need to get them out into, into federations, into synagogues in the diaspora, and getting to Hillel, and getting to young people, and have them tell their story about how they had to leave their house, their business in France or the UK to go to Israel from a security standpoint because there's nowhere else to go. I, my family, my, my in-laws are South African. They put diamonds away and gold away in a safety deposit box because they're, they're never sure when they're going to have to get out and make a move to Israel. Today. Today. I have friends that are LBGDQ that are, get, have gotten new passports. I think you have to break it down to, you know, certain moments in history that I think as our age group takes for granted. These kids don't fully understand the St. Louis. They don't understand the St. Louis. They don't understand what that means, how a ship of Jews during the Holocaust was sent away from the United States for them all to die in the Holocaust. And how important, if Israel was there, those people would have lived. And I think we have to understand that, 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 Kids need to understand. Right now, I think the Holocaust for a lot of kids is become something that is like the War of eighteen twelve. Enough all right. It's, it's a, they all want to study it. They all want. They're all interested. In learning they're interested, about it, but, but it's become historical. It's, it's right. not. It's not something that they feel is ever going to touch them in the same way. You know, I I lived in when my grand, my grandparents lived in three hundred two five Ocean Avenue, and every door had a mezuzah. And I almost in my you know we had family that survived the Holocaust because of righteous Christians, but but so many of the people on, on, on the sixth floor of 3025 Ocean Avenue, they never came back. My grandmother's best friend, they, they, you know, her, she came here on a vacation to visit her aunt and uncle. She couldn't go back, she lost her entire family. But that's the story I was hearing at 12. How many 12, 13 year olds are hearing that story now or experiencing that? And I think that's what needs, that, that kind of conversation I think needs to happen with young people about Israel because it's jumping right up now into politics and in, 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 in one state solution, two state solution, East Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza. It's let's get, get it, break it down to the basics here. There's, why you know why does it exist? Why why do we need Israel so desperately as a as Jewish people? Because we need to have security. We have nowhere else to go. There's a lot of Jews that have nowhere else to go. So there's two two articles I'd like to recommend to people that you can two article one's an article and one's a book. The article you can find on the internet. Peter Beinert, who's a, who's a writer, yep. um, and is on sort of more of the left wing, but he wrote his first article that sort of really made people sort of wake up and take notice. He wrote it probably about eight or nine years ago. It was in the New York, Re New York Review of Books. And his essential thesis was, in terms of young Jews today, he said, we, we've raised this generation of, of young Jews, young Jewish kids and college students, to, to be very liberal in their thinking. And so when it comes to issues like immigration or the environment or LGBTQ rights or things like yeah, that, that's right. they're, 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 very, they're out on the forefront being 
about sort of marching for those causes. Um, and yet when it comes to Israel, we have asked them to check their liberalism at the door. And, and he said, and so we, the, the, they're, and these young people are now turning around and looking at the generation that taught them and said, wait a second, which, which side of your mouth are you talking out of? So I, I really commend you going on Google and read the, yeah. re find that article. The book that I really commend to all of you um, is a fairly new book out uh, by Micha Goodman, who's a, a teacher, a writer, Orthodox Jew from Israel, modern Orthodox Jew from Israel, but very much on sort of politically on the, well, you read his book and in fact, those on the left wing call him right wing and those on the right wing call him left wing. So he's happy, he's upsetting everybody. Um, it's the right place to be. And his book is called Catch 67. And it was written originally in Israel in Hebrew and it was a bestseller. Uh, and it's been translated into English recently. And I just heard him speak to the Westchester Board of Rabbis on Monday. And the, idea, the premise of the book is Catch 67, Catch 67. If you remember the book Catch 22, it's that same idea. But it's that since, since the 1967 war in Israel, the Six Day War, when Israel captured you know, the Sinai, the West Bank, Gaza, put itself into this Catch 67. And he really sort of breaks down a lot of the questions that have been being raised here tonight that for example, the BDS faces and things like that to really understand both sides of, of the situation and the complexity of it. And it's only about 170 pages, so um, really well written, and I recommend it to you. I'm not sure this is a question either, but you've been talking about Jewish children and their ambivalence at best towards Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly have seen that, but I mean, you can talk about Jewish adults these days. I mean, many of us love the idea of Israel. We've been there, uh, we see I think a lot of what's going on in Europe is not necessarily around Israel. I think there's a disenfranchisement since, since the end of World War II when, they, when the Europeans brought in mass numbers of, of uh, North Africans and, and Arabs to rebuild after the war. And there's been a tremendous disenfranchisement. Most of the young people that have actually done a lot of the, the terror attacks are ones that were born in those countries. Uh, and a lot of it is because there has been a lack of upward mobility uh, you know, these countries are not, you know, nation of immigrants the way the United States is, which are, you know, John F. Kennedy's famous book. And I think when you have a fifth or sixth generation kid who is not any better off than his great grandfather was who came here in 1950, it allows for people to become radicalized. Part, certainly part of the radical Islamic extremist narrative, Israel's part of that. But I think a lot of this also stems from a lack of social, economic, and educational mobility uh, that these people have in these countries, for sure. There's no doubt. Yeah. They can also take advantage of this ambivalence for, regarding Israel, what's going on, and what has been going on, to yeah. sort of germinate more sort of anti-Israeli fervor and therefore more anti-Semitic fervor. I, I, it, it has to be all interrelated. And I fear that, again, in this country, maybe some of the, you know, what's going on maybe because Jews themselves, many Jews feel very ambivalent. So I think, I think for Jewish people when it comes to Israel, there's, there's two pieces to this puzzle at least two. One piece of the puzzle is to understand that for Jewish people when it comes to Israel, there's at least three ways to look at it. There's, there's the state of Israel, which is the current, the government and, the, and how it operates. There was the land of Israel, which is this idea that the Jewish people have a homeland because 
by our name itself, you know, Judaism is it's, it's the land of Judah. What's that? It's our land. It's the it, land yeah, of Judah. Judah. We are the people of Judah. So there's this connection to that that land, and to be Jewish without Israel part, as part of the equation is a very it's very difficult to do that. And then there's then there's finally the the people of Israel. This connection, this idea that Jewish people have a connection to other Jewish people around the world, and therefore an obligation, in fact, to one another. Um, and so when you speak about, for example, you know, Jews of France of having to move to Israel, I, I feel a personal connection and my heart goes out to those people. And so I think it's important to be able to distinguish between the three. And sometimes you can actually say, I have a connection to the people and I have a connection to the land, even if my current connection to the state is not necessarily in line with my, my current my current political thinking. And, and the, the second part of the puzzle is that I find, this is my personal view on this, that the Jewish people can get very, we can be very critical of Israel because of whatever their current policies are. Um, and then we can sort of say to ourselves, well, we're gonna write it off and we're not gonna, have, we're not gonna feel connected to it. We're gonna be feeling ambivalent about it. But we can also live in this country and perhaps feel you know, upset, frustrated, ambivalent, whatever towards the current pol the policies of whatever current government happens to be in power um, and we're not abandoning this country so quickly you know we're, we're, we're not necessarily dealing with what the French Jews are and you know making Aliyah and moving to Israel we're not necessarily even though people I'm, I'm a dual citizen of Canada and the United States and a, a number of people over the last year and a half two years have, have come up to me sort of half, half jokingly saying like, so can you sponsor me for citizenship or things like that? You know, or, or, or do you have, you have an escape clause? Can you take me with you? But it's, it's, it, there's a lot of joking in that because people aren't necessarily just leaving because they don't like the government here. So politics are what they are. Politics change. It, you know, it's like, they say it's like a bus, right? If you don't like it, this one, just wait for the next one. It'll, it'll grow and change. But I think the deeper questions have to be, do we feel a sense of connection? To the land, to the history, to the people, um, and 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 if we can try to instill that, which is the power of organ groups like you know the power of summer Israel trips for for teenagers and the power of birthright for college kids and those kind of things that helps to fill that that sense of connection. Yep. Joan. Yeah, um, we're very busy talking about our kids and BBS and helping our kids understand what it's all about. But I think in the community like we live in. We are a very small minority, so how do we, in conjunction with the churches and everybody else, work with all of the kids so that they also understand what BDS is all about, what we're talking about? Or even what anti Semitism is Our kids are having troubles, and we've raised many to be very liberal. The non Jewish um, community has raised their children the same way. What are you doing in the right country? And so on and so forth. Anti bias education. It's not public, though. They don't understand this or why they shouldn't support it. So I think we need to have some kind of program or something so that the whole community I spoke there. Um, can begin to understand what's going on. Because um, we need to educate. We need to educate our kids, but the community also needs to. One, one of the things I found is. When I started trying to do work, I went to Israel in February with uh, over 200 Caribbean Americans. It was their trip. It was five churches. And uh, they're all from Crown Heights. And the, the pastor Monroe's inv invited me, Seventh-day Adventist minister, invited me on the trip. He and I are friends. He's the borough president's uh, a director of uh, interfaith uh, initiatives. And I was the only, only white person on the trip. And I was, the, it was literally the only Jew on the trip. And we walked in the footsteps of Jesus. And through that trip, I really wanted to start focusing more on working with, uh, with people of color. And I, and I really saw the, and, my, and I, I usually, I, I went to the Caribbean community because Pastor Monroe and I had become such good friends. Like it was an easy entry point. And I think so much entry point has to come through your personal relationships. Now, like I like that group. You got to find someone you can connect with and build, those, build that rapport. It can't be transactional. It's got to be real. I'm on the board now of his church. My wife and I are donors to that church. Mm -hmm. um, it's real, you know? And so it, what I got out of that was I thought, well, you know what? ADL is one of the leading, leading you know, anti-bias you know, training organizations in the country. We're the leading 
uh, provider of anti-bias education to, uh, to New York City Public Schools, the DOE. And so I'm gonna go in and have these conversations with, with these church heads and say, we can bring anti-bias into your, into your thing. And then from there, we can start talking about anti-Semitism. And it was like, the, you know, because Pastor Monroe and I are friends. He's like, no, that's not going to happen. Like, what do you mean it's not going to happen? He's like, Evan, that's not our issue. We're not going to listen to you about this issue. What you need to do is, because you've been gone since the 60s as a collective group, you need to be able to come back and start talking about our issues. His issue is gun violence. Okay? And, so, and racial justice. And racial justice. But, and so... We are now serious partners on gun violence. There's a thing called the Clergy Council in Brooklyn. Uh, there's a thing called the God Squad, which we're, we're helping with. And we're, we're going to be bringing this Clergy Council around the United States to help communities that have a serious gang and gun-related violence to get pastors and clergies involved. But now, because this has been going on for over a year, now we can start having conversations around anti-Semitism. And guess what? When Pittsburgh happened, I, 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 five years of building these relationships, I said, I'm, I'm going to push the button. And I pushed the button, and on that Sunday, we had, we had, you know, we had, the, we had a Haitian ambassador, Mexican, uh, UN, the UN ambassador to, to, uh, to Mexico. We had multiple clergy, multiple colors, multiple faiths, every kind of background you can imagine standing behind me at our podium because I didn't go at it from anti Semitism. I went at it from whatever issue their issue was in their area whether it was immigration policy or ICE or gun violence. And now after that relationship, it's showing where I can help, how I can stand with them. Now they're willing to stand with me and now they're willing to have that conversation. So I think that's the way you need to have those conversations to show that we're not just caring about ourselves, but that we're actually caring about the other. Then they, can, then they will be willing to listen to us on our issue. And I can, and I can speak on that on firsthand actual knowledge of, of doing it. But I think that's how we start talking about anti-Semitism is actually what is, you know, you know, what is it your church wants? What, what, are, what are your needs? And finding that commonality and how can, you know, this community help you on that? And then God forbid if something happened, then you're going to be willing to stand there. But if you're coming as transactional, it's, it doesn't work. It can't be, these relationships cannot be transactional. And the carrying on these issues, even though it may not be your core issue, has to be as, it is, as, it, as if it is your core issue and get knee deep in it and get your hands dirty. So I want to end with one last question for you. Um, and there, there are afterwards, I think there's some coffee and tea and that traditional Hanukkah food of jelly donuts. <laughs> the soup kind yot. Exactly, because we know that the Maccabees, as soon as they, after they lit that oil, they-, they were, Everyone was pushing that jelly right in. Right, yeah. that's right, they retired it, you know, that and Dunkin' Donuts, that's they were right. right there. So it's- the that's, idea, that's what the statement, they got time to make the donuts. It, right. came, it came right after the battle. That's right. Because they had eight days to right. just, it was, the miracle was working. Um, the, the, the idea is during Hanukkah, for those of you not aware, you eat foods that are cooked in oil to commemorate that, that miracle. Um, the response to Pittsburgh was, was overwhelming. Yeah. Um, this sanctuary was filled with close to 500 people that Sunday night for an interfaith prayer vigil. Uh, I was one earlier that day, that same day in White Plains, there were 4,000 people there. Um, yeah, and, and each time each of these major incidents have happened, when Charlottesville happened, when Pittsburgh happened, one of the phone calls I made was to a member of this congregation who, who survived the Holocaust, was, was in camps. Um, and I called her because I knew that these kind of moments would yeah, possibly sure. trigger something in her. Um, so I spoke to her after Pittsburgh, and, <laughs> and she, in her sort of wonderful, cynical, realistic way said to me, Rabbi, look, you know, Pittsburgh happened, but sadly, I don't feel people will learn. Uh, she said, look, they're going to go back to their lives and nothing will change. So I want to know your thinking. Do you agree or disagree with her? I agree Was with her. Was Pittsburgh a tipping point or a watershed? I agree with her, unfortunately. I think what, what's happened in our society is we've become so immune to things that we never dreamed we'd become immune to. I think, the, again, of social media, I hate to keep throwing it on social media, but I mean, think about how many shootings there have been, mass shootings, mass casualty shootings in this country. Not anti-Semitic, but just Not, mass. Just mass casualty right. shootings right. in this country. If the only mass casualty shooting was a synagogue in Pittsburgh, I think that may have resonated. But when you have Parkland and you have Vegas and you just, you can name them. Right. You know, if it's Sandy Hook, even farther, you know, you, you have, um, I think, there's people are becoming immune to what they never imagined they'd become immune to. They're immune in, in New York City. They are immune 
I mean, we had recently a yeshiva kid that was beaten outside of his yeshiva. Not one elected official spoke out. I never thought in a million years. And I, we called their offices. And I called them out and they still didn't speak out. So, it, like, that's the challenge here. So are we living Pastor Niemöller's poem? You know, first they came for the communists and I wasn't I mean, communist, yeah. so I didn't speak out. And... I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, I, I think it's, it, I think it's, it's overall, I think we're just so, we're, there's so much information. It's information overload. It's overstimulation. There's so much, this is my personal opinion here. I, I think it's, you have so much stimulation. If you go on a Twitter feed, you can get 30 different things. You know, it's the Mueller investigation. There's this thing, there's the Trump falling off a thing. He's signing the wrong place. Like it's, it's so many other things. This person just got, you know, bus accident in China. The bus goes off the edge. See, you're seeing horrific things all the time, all the time. That I think it's impossible for us to, to keep that up emotionally and care at the same level every single time. What was interesting was um, the new uh, deputy counsel general to Israel, uh, Israel Nitzan, came into my office, and he's new to kind of dias diaspora Jewry, and I was really close to his, uh, his uh, predecessor, Amir Sagi, uh, who's the deputy counsel general in New York. And, uh, and Amir really had a very good grasp of diaspora Jewry and really understood it. And I think Israel is, is aware that he needs to learn. He's learning more. And he's asking a lot of questions. He's a wonderful guy. I love him. And he came to my office because he came right in like a couple few months ago and he came right in the heart. It was, a, you know, a storm of, of just tons of anti-Semitic incidents, you know, like the worst time for him to come in. And he came to my office and Amir never came to my office. Israel came to my office and he says, and he said to me, I, I need to get a perspective here. I need to get an understanding of like, are, are Jews really freaking out? This is before Pittsburgh. This is about a week and a half, two weeks before Pittsburgh. And he says to me, is it really, when are Jews, are they really freaking out? Is it really that bad? And I said, I think if you're an Orthodox Jew in Brooklyn, uh, wearing a kippah, I think you're, 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 you're freaking out a little bit. I think you're, you're, you're for sure changing your, your lifestyle a little bit. Um, I think if you're the average kind of either Westchester or, you know, Rockland County or, you know, Morris, you know, Morristown, Summit, New Jersey, Jew, or, or Upper West Side, your life is not, you, you may be stopping your tracks, you're going to read it, but then you're going to keep scrolling down something else and you're not going to have the same impact. And he's like, what do you think, Evan, is going to have an impact? I said, if God forbid, a bomb goes off in Park East, okay? Two weeks later, whatever Park it was, East, Park East synagogue. synagogue. synagogue okay, so right, a synagogue Park bombing. Park. Like there'd be a, a Park East synagogue bombing and then maybe that would shake the, you know, the Jewish community to its core and get us kind of relaser focused on this issue. Then Pittsburgh happens a couple weeks later. And we saw, for sure, we saw this tremendous outcry. We saw about a week-long mourning period. And we saw some amazing stuff. The Pittsburgh Penguins putting their, on their NHL uniforms, the Star of David, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Amazing outpour. But, but it's kind of like, it's kind of moved on. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's it just, it, you know, it, I just don't feel the same. I don't feel like people are, are, are their lives have been, you know, radically changed because of what happened in Pittsburgh. I did feel that after Charlottesville. I think a lot of people really freaked out after Charlottesville when they saw the chanting and the, and the tiki torches and the, it was kind of like the Nuremberg kind of you know, right. imagery and very, very scary. But I think th this is being a mass shooting, I think hit a, the Jewish community deeper than it hit the others. But I do think that it, there's been a numbness that goes because there's just so much of this. And that, that scares me to death is that when, when I saw an assault take place in, in Queens, and no one really spoke out. It was one reporter, because I knew the reporter, Jessica Lane at CBS came out and covered it. Otherwise, there would have been no coverage of that assault mm -hmm. on a 16-year-old boy. That is... Where we've come to. That's where we've come to. Right. And that scares me. So I think your being here tonight and your taking the time to be here tonight um, resonates with... <laughs> states very powerfully that this issue is resonating for you. And that you don't, I'm talking, you know, that you don't want to stand for it and you don't want these communities to stand for it. And I think we, we have to, we start locally. We yep. start in our own communities to say this is who we are and what we stand for. And hopefully that somehow resonates and then ripples out. And we, we say this is who we are and what we, we stand for certain values of, of bring light into darkness. And don't let people get away with it. it right. You know, like in Queens, like there should have been fire and brimstone people standing outside elected officials offices if something happens in westchester if something happens in your community demand that elected officials and leaders address it 
and do something about it. Don't just talk about it amongst yourselves. Don't just go on Facebook and rant about it. Actually use your vote, use you, you as a constituency, you, hold these people accountable. They can create change. It's your job, it's your duty as a, as a citizen to make sure that they are doing their job as electeds and as other community leaders to, to speak out on this and be your representative. Don't let them off the hook. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing that. Thank you. Thank you. So Evan's able to, to stick around for a little while. As I said, there's some refreshments uh, if you'd like that.